Welcome to today's video webcast, Extending Semiconductor Component Life Cycles for Critical Military and Aerospace Applications. Our sponsor today is Rochester Electronics in Newburyport, Massachusetts. And this webcast is brought to you by Military and Aerospace Electronics Online. I'm Associate Editor Jamie Whitney. This webcast will outline options available to extend semiconductor component product life cycles and delay obsolescence. The pros and cons of each option will be discussed while the viewer will learn of the various services and solutions available. This webinar's distinguished presenter is Dan Dice, who serves as the Director of Design Technology for Rochester Electronics. Dan has more than 35 years of semiconductor design experience. Before we begin, a few words about our webcast. This presentation is both live and interactive. So you can ask questions at any time via the ask a question box in the presentation window. We will answer as many of those questions as we are able during the Q&A portion at the end of the webinar. A copy of the slide presentation has been made available in the event resources tab, where you may also download other resources provided. If you have any technical difficulties during the webinar, just type your issue into the ask a question box and a member of our team will assist you. So, Let's get started. Dan? Thank you, Jamie. And uh, welcome everyone taking out time of your day to uh, come listen to Rochester Electronics and some solutions that we have to extend the life of critical components for the uh, military and aerospace applications. A little bit of background on Rochester Electronics in, in case you don't know. Rochester has been around for 40 years and we're all about extending the life of semiconductor products past when the original component manufacturer wants to continue offering them as active components. And we're all 100% authorized. Everything at Rochester is, is that, 100% authorized. We don't go out in the broker market and buy product. Everything we have is 100% um, authorized, including our new silicon options. And with that, I'll step into the presentation. So today's market is, is really incredibly challenging as all of you likely have experienced. Uh, you know, the um, aerospace and defense industries have product life cycles that extend way longer than what the semiconductor companies want to continue to offer products. So this can be difficult and expensive and, and, and uh, you know, the original equipment manufacturers want to continue to offer these products uh, as they go. They don't want to, they don't want to uh, redesign all the time, refresh all the time. And, and Rochester has some options for you that I'll be talking about today. If you look at the challenges for today's components, component engineers, you really have suppliers, what we call suppliers, the original component manufacturers, who are consolidating product lines, even during the dramatic increase in the uh, semiconductor uh, market uh, of late, you, know, you still have consolidating product lines and, and decreased production phase and increasing end of life. Uh, you know, today's end of life and last time buy is really brought on by the booming market and product line focus. Tomorrow's consolidating product lines will be as a result of overbuilding and, and it'll be the classic boom bust semiconductor cycle. It's all going to happen again. And, and today we've got seemingly endless push outs, supply chain challenges, um, the major uh, offshore assembly and test providers are moving away from lead frame assemblies. And, and what you see are dips and PLCCs and plastic quads and even SOICs with a timeline that are moving away. And lead-free options, of course. Uh, Amcor, for example, is, is a, has been 100% lead-free for, for quite some time now. There's also strong growth in fabulous IC revenue. And, and why does that matter? Well, if you take a look at what used to be the integrated device manufacturers or IDMs, they had their own fabs and they would take the forecast as something was coming toward an end and they would likely overbuild 
And so there was going to be some buffer in there at the last time by. But for fabulous companies, there isn't an overbuilt situation. Essentially, it's built to order. And more and more of the semiconductor market today is built to order, which means you're not going to have parts that just magically happen to be around in the market other than uh, potentially uh, refurbished or um, uh, reused components. So uh, more on the challenges. You, you, this is uh, from supply frame and also Levadata provided uh, a couple pieces of information here. You can see the lead times. Um, the longest lead time is actually the highest demand. Kind of makes sense. Microcontroller and microprocessors are experiencing the longest lead time, uh, where where capacitors and and resistors are are decreased in 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 uh, in lead time, but still uh, still long out there. Uh, it isn't unusual for Rochester to see um, lead frame assembly lead times. Um, sticking out there at uh, 52 weeks uh, that isn't unusual in this today today and 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 that's incredible pressure on component engineers to try to um, ensure supply so you got a couple options as a component engineer you got you got last time buy in-house long-term storage um, that's the the pros of that are obviously you you're going to be able to get the parts you buy and you're going to know you have them. And uh, it is, however, cash up front, expensive, requires facilities, expertise, and accurate projections. That And, and in 14 years at Rochester, uh, I've never seen uh, accurate projections as to what a system might need um, that far out, 10 years out, 20 years out, like the mill arrow market. And, and of course, that large initial investment you could also try for some cases, rare cases nowadays, there might be a, an alternate component that uh, you know, could could be substituted in. Uh, that's a little bit risky, uh, requires design requalification. Um, and it, it, if you got embedded software, that's not likely to happen. Um, last option, of course, is working with somebody like Rochester Electronics. Um, and it's it's going to ensure that you can get the exact same product that you had before. Um, and and the last thing is uh, consider redesign for the same performance. This is an option not a lot of people think of. What if you went to somebody like Rochester who's been around for 40 years, has stock of product, and really asked, hey, what products do you have in stock where I could design a system and know this product's going to be around for 20 years and I won't have to worry about it. That is an option that most people don't take, but it's one that's out there. We've got product that we, the rate at which things have sold, we know that it's it's going to be around forever, but that's a design option that that really people could take is is to dig in and find out what products do you have available that I know I could design in and would not uh, would not go out on me. Talk a little bit about the market. This is more background for you. Uh, yeah, this is from SIA, which um, it, it busts up into segments, and you can kind of tell that the the influence, the major influences here, really the uh, data center, which is uh, here, it's called PC computer, uh, communications, portable markets, cell phones and tablets and so forth. And the last is automotive. And automotive, if you've purchased a car or tried to purchase a car in the last couple of years, you know the electronic story there is it's a significantly delayed production from shortage of semiconductor product. But these are the biggest three markets. And, and this is what the semiconductor companies, these are what the semiconductor companies are primarily targeting with all their new product development. And that's important to keep that in mind because they're not targeting mill arrow with new product development. They will. They will certainly have products Mill Arrow can use, but it's really all about automotive communications, which is uh, portables, and then the data center for a majority of their product focus. 
All right, let's take a look again. Here's some more data, it, it, understanding the supply chain. You know, people say supply chain, supply chain. What does that mean? Well, it, you've got a, a narrow semiconductor value chain, which is really the design foundry and, and back end, which is packaging and testing. But that's that's not all. Obviously, there's a, a, the broader value chain includes the materials and capital equipment and, and EDA tools and, and design IP up front. But the entire thing, and, and indeed a lot of the delays we're seeing today, it, it includes PCBs and, and end product um, uh, that, that is put together, manufactured, assembled, and, and then finally sold as, as an end product. And if you look at the entire supply chain physical location, where is it? Uh, you can see it's really spread around the world, uh, everywhere from uh, the US and Taiwan and China and, and in Europe. Uh, typically, the front end design portion of it is the US and, and Europe, along with the equipment set uh, necessary for advanced semiconductor. And then you take a look at where it's manufactured and it goes to uh, Taiwan and China and uh, other parts of Asia for assembly and test. That's classically how it all flows, but the point here is that the total supply chain is global. There's, there's no one country that has all the pieces. That's not the way it works. So saying, you know, the CHIPS Act just got signed and, and the CHIP Act, it, it, it is going for, there's a portion, a cutout of that that's meant for research and development and universities and STEM and education and all that. And then there's the rest of it that's incentivizing bringing that back to the US. That's going to take a very long period of time, and and that amount of money in the Chip Act, that's a, it's a nice start. But you can imagine the the billions necessary to really perpetuate this and really bring it back is far beyond what the Chip Act does. So it it, it it's not that uh, we're going to crawl before we uh, run for sure in the U.S. And it's really not something that's going to immediately make a difference in where product is bought or where product is designed and, and how it's designed. So here's how you got the whole summary of, of, of problems ahead that uh, I've outlined here. And I want to talk a little bit about how Rochester can help now because this is supposed to be about options and and really we have a couple different options that um, broadly that uh, that we we have offered the market and and option a uh, on this slide is really talking about product line transfers built on demand it's a it's a wafer transfer typically from the original manufacturer where we've got all the wafer storage in-house and then we we do assembly test and qual of the product. And it, and we're starting there with the original semiconductor wafer product from the original manufacturer. And we're testing to the original, using the original manufacturer's test program. And I wanna take a minute and just um, talk about that because it, it when when a product is tested, when we say test, uh, unfortunately there's, there's people who who say a product is tested and and really it's nothing more than data sheet testing best case uh, some people say testing is as6081 as6081 is primarily a visual standard it's like is this part counterfeit and tell me with basic visual inspection whether or not this thing is counterfeit that's not really testing a product Testing a product is putting it on an actual semiconductor component tester, but testing a product from an authorized source like Rochester is actually taking the original test program and testing the product. The original test program from the semiconductor manufacturers is something pretty special. There's there, on, on processors and microcontrollers, complex product where you really want to make sure it's right. There's, a, there's tens of or even hundreds of man years wrapped up in the development of that test program. Test program is going way beyond the data sheet. It's not a simple test program that, oh, I'm going to grab the data sheet, I'm going to test the limits, and I'm going to say the product is tested. That's 
that's okay. It's better than nothing, better than AS6081, which is what the uh, broker testing is. But this, but testing as Rochester is doing it is with the original manufacturer's test program. If you think about it, you know, we could take take a great example here is a, like an Intel processor or an NXP processor for which we're authorized, and we get the original test program from them. It is a culmination of every test escape that has ever come out against that product wrapped up into one test program that tests everything way beyond the limits of a data sheet. And it, it, it's, it's meant to filter out everything that could possibly be wrong, that ever was wrong with the product that got shipped into the highest volume customers at the end. So be careful when you talk about test and, and when you ask to go test something, there, there's different grades of test. And, and I just want to take a moment and kind of harp on that because what Rochester's doing is authorized tests where we get the test program from the original manufacturer Many times it's on the original test platform as well, and and I'll go into some of that. It 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 makes a difference. It really does in in the quality of the product you get in the end. Option B here is is design archive. It's what my group does at Rochester. So that's kind of a, a method of last resort, is how I joke with it. Um, but it's really meant as there are no other options available. There's no finished goods in the warehouse. There's no um, there's no wafer that we could try to build from. Uh, this is where, um, best case, you've got a design database from the original manufacturer that uh, we take in and, and, and we create new silicon. That is a drop-in replacement. And I'll go into detail on, on what I mean by that. And that's another option. And we do that as, and, and we've got design replication, but product porting, but we also have uh, form fit function options, which the form fit, op for fit function options are really taking um, and, and creating a, an ASIC for, for instance, uh, if you can't get a, uh, an FPGA product anymore, uh, but your program is solid, that's an option for us to create an ASIC out of it if the design itself is portable and if the design archive works out and so forth. Okay, let's let's move on. I spent a lot of time on that one. We've got three manufacturing, major manufacturing facilities, and, and I'm going to go through a little bit about our investment in assembly and test and, and wafer storage and dye and so forth first. And, and we've got the corporate headquarters in Building 16, which is really all test and burn-in and, and, and failure analysis lab and, and wafer dye storage, some wafer dye storage. We've got wafer dye storage in multiple buildings. Um, you got building nine, which is really all about plastic assembly and, and lead finishing and plating. And then building 10, which is primarily targeted at this market, the mill aero market, which is all about hermetic assembly and reliability testing. And that we've been doing uh, for, for many years uh, out of building 10. And I'll go through more about what that is all about. We also have uh, storage services for dye wafer. Uh, I'm going to say that we're the largest um, dye bank in the world uh, when you talk about number of different products. So it's, uh, it, it's literally uh, billions of dye under storage. And we have wafers as old as 1968. And of course, today as well, 12 inch, 2 inch to 12 inch wafers, uh, temperature, humidity controlled, access restricted. A little bit about dye storage. There are places in the world where you know they're they're going to uh, uh, they have an incredibly elaborate uh, dye storage mechanisms and uh, uh, you know they but we have also uh, been doing this for forty years and and we have uh, in the reference material. There is a, a white paper that we uh, we recently kicked out, and, and we're going to keep uh, expanding upon that white paper, building on it. And and basically, it talks about taking product that has been under storage for 15, 16, 17 years and proven that it mounts cleanly on boards. You don't have solderability issues. You don't have reliability issues. Um, 
that white paper in the reference material actually goes hand in hand with a, a, a TI white paper that was recently updated at the end of last year that also talks about 15 year life. So any of this um, um, old date code kind of concerns, uh, two year date code uh, that we, we've heard in the industry, uh, really that's not backed up by any data. And I will challenge anybody that says, uh, you know, we have to have two year date code, that, that doesn't make sense. It's not backed up by data. And I think we, uh, we have a really solid story there. Uh, we also have capacity up to 30 billion die, um, and and we've really thought through this quite a bit. We've uh, been around long enough, and we continue to monitor this. That uh, we're confident we've got a really good solution here. But if you've got die wafer, you got to be able to do something with it. You can't just uh, store the wafer without being able to do back grinding and dicing, and we've got that in place as well. So uh, wafer back grinding, we're able to do in-house uh, we have to be able to do that because we've got our own plastic assembly uh, we're able to get down uh, quite thin on the wafers um, and uh, got a quite accurate um, way to do that too with uh, uh, with the equipment that we have uh, wafer dicing again all the way two inch to 12 inch handling uh, fully automated uh, wafer dicing so in essence we can do die processing as well that isn't uh, that isn't beyond what what we have done and what we can do and moving on to uh, die sorting uh, and we've got a way to do to take then what you've got and on tape using uh, you know wafer maps and waffle packs gel packs tape and reel or any other kind of uh, um, means by which you want to receive dye and along the way to automatic optical inspection. So it it's quite a uh, advanced uh, machine, uh, Mubar, um, which uh, which we've got in-house and already already using. Talk a little bit about our package assembly roadmaps. Uh, it, it, it's, when you talk about package assembly at, at Rochester Electronics, a little bit different than than what the leading edge um, in in, uh, in in Malaysia is going to be. We don't we aren't doing that again. We're extending the life of semiconductor products. So everything we're putting in place is because it's leaving the largest OSATs, and we're putting it in place to extend the life of the semiconductor product. So you can see what we're focused on this year is PLCC, uh, QFN, and and really BGA. And, and what we know we've got to get to is a reliable way to replace SOIC and uh, TSSOPs and, and those kind of things. Because again, it's a lead frame technology. Lead frames are, are going away. It's only a question of when, not if. Um, it's just far more efficient. The volume today for volume assembly is is really all about QFN and BGA. So Rochester's stepping up here. We've already got uh, 44, 68, and 84 pin PLCC uh, equipment uh, ordered. Um, actually, the, the 84 is already in, um, and we're going to be getting all that uh, set up, qualified, and so forth uh, the remainder of this year. Uh, and shipping product this year on the 84, actually. Okay, and talk about hermetic assembly capability. You know, it. it I, I just briefly touched that we've been doing this for a long time, and 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 really this is for mill aero and and the high temperature markets as well, uh, commercial and military flows, keel mill certified. Uh, in-house reliability testing. We don't have to subcon out to do all the reliability testing and uh, it, everything's under one roof. So it's uh, it's been something we've been doing for a, a very long period of time. Plastic packaging, again, we're, we're coming into this having uh, put in dips a couple years ago and, and just been expanding ever since on that. Um, it, it uh, the mold equipment that we're bringing in um, really allows us to um, get pretty high throughput, and and we're actually uh, talk we're 
talking directly to some of the semiconductor companies as package obsolescence happens for them we're trying to be in place to again extend the life of the semiconductor product but do it in an authorized way directly with the semiconductor companies as their lead frame plastic packages go obsolete tin lead finishing uh, I, I mentioned earlier that lead has gone away uh, we've got a full plating line in-house and solder dipping, again, QML certified um, and, and plating for plastic packages as well. So um, MAT-10 is going to be uh, qualified here. Uh, it was qualified at the end of last year. So electrical tests, let's talk a little bit about that because it test at Rochester, again, is different because we're fully authorized, but it's also different because what we have in place at Rochester is a very heterogeneous test environment. It's it's when you when you typically go to test houses and and you look around, you will see a lot of very specific tester types because they don't want to have twelve different tester types uh, for them because it's all about throughput and efficiency and, and so forth. Um, for us, we have a mix of the old and the new. Uh, we've got to uh, kind of keep up with both to to be able to uh, handle all the different products. If a semiconductor company turns around and invests hundreds of man years into a test program solution for a product line, um, you know, a great example would be um, for uh, back in the day with old uh, uh, Intel embedded x86 type of products you know they had they had quite a trillium collection and and we we have that in-house and that's how uh, we have gone on and done that but trillium is obviously not an, an active uh, test platform out there plenty of century testers so forth but we also have j750 ETS 88 um, from Teradyne and and we have the more recent things as well so we're, our, our test platforms are very uh, heterogeneous and, and able to handle a wide variety of products and a wide variety of semiconductor companies because the semiconductor companies tend to develop with a specific platform for a specific product line. And we want to be able to continue to test exactly the way they tested, if at all possible. So with tests, we can do uh, upscreening uh, and, and device burn-in, wafer probe, wafer map generation, all the standard things that a, um, a, a test house can do. Uh, we do that for our own assemblies. Now, a lot more about design engineering because that's, that's what my group is. Uh, we, we have an unusually experienced group, so a little over 350 man years of experience, and, and that's that's quite a lot considering there's, um, uh, you know, how many people we have, um, analog and digital design and, and experts in all, all these kind of things um, is, that are listed here on the page. I won't read them all off. Um, and we've, we've been able to port a bunch of different products um, varying in many, many years. And I'll, I'll, I'll show you some uh, on the next slide. This, this is just a smattering of some of our uh, successfully replicated products, everything from uh, processors, complex processors, to uh, uh, smaller um, uh, analog products. It, but this isn't um, this isn't starting with a net list and doing a new layout. That isn't that isn't the way we go about for processor products specifically. If you take a look at this this Intel product or or this Intel product or this uh, NXP was Freescale Motorola product or even this this uh, ASIC, um, both of these, this ASIC here and uh, this uh, 0.35 micron CMOS ASIC, about a million transistors was for a DAL-A product. If you know commercial avionics, that's the highest uh, highest level of reliability required. Same with this uh, MPC603R processor. The way we approach those is way beyond um, uh, more simplistic methodologies such as the GEM offers, for example, which is a, 
you know, kind of convert it to spice and then make it match into a bicemos Gatorade. We don't go down that path. This is actually taking the physical layout, the 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 original GDS2 um, database that was there at the at the original manufacturer, and physically porting it to a fab process that is similar enough that we can tune the individual transistors or redesign the analog blocks to fit in the original box they were within and guarantee at the end that the product is a drop-in to the original. No new errata, physically the same size die and drops into the customer system and, and just works. Really all the customer has to do is ver very simple simplistic ver verification, validation. They don't have to worry about any software changing. Uh, we're not fixing errata. Uh, it is the exact same thing. So these are these are a smattering of products we've we've already done. We've already kicked out, and uh, it, it it is physical porting as, as one of the options that we uh, that we do. Our licensed manufacturing is is really consists of uh, building to stock because a lot of times we want to build ahead when we can see that standard products, we can see what rate at which they're moving. We want to make sure that those products are there, that we don't get into lead times or queue time problems. And during this shortage that uh, over the past couple of years, that has really been um, a, a great thing for Rochester to offer to the market is, is a built to stock uh, option where we take existing die wafer we have built it to stock. That way customers don't have the long lead times. We also do build to order uh, off of drawings, SCDs, custom stuff, for, especially for the mill market, and that's customer driven and then product replication, uh, which is what my group does, or a form fit function drop in replacement, uh, which I, I didn't really go into too much, but I certainly can offline from here. I got some case studies here that uh, I, I wanna talk about mostly because it it kind of shows that um, it, it, it we're not not just in the mill arrow market, but also kind of different cases of of what we got into. Um, the 68040 here uh, was used on a uh, a ventilator product by by a uh, major uh, ventilator manufacturer, and uh, we had die wafer for the 68040, but the uh, um, it, we did the package didn't exist anymore, and so we needed to uh, recreate the package and do all the assembly and test in house, and and we did that and qualified it, and and we've been shipping. You know, we're also working on uh, an MC sixty eight zero thirty new silicon uh, for a customer. We already have the sixty eight zero twenty, so this is kind of a you know a continuation of the early coal fire product line. Uh, where we have uh, excelled at creating new silicon so the customers don't have to worry about that. So, um, yeah, the, the CERQUAD package for the 68030 is also not available. Uh, so we had to go create um, a, a new package um, that, that could drop in there. So that's that's a case study. And, and another case study here is uh, a clock generator component, um, you know, is reaching end of life. Uh, it, we, it, it was a, a SIGI uh, product. Uh, wafers inspect or wafers sent to us, and and we did a QFN on that one. You know, you talk about clock generator. My my group right now is working on a Cypress uh, CY seven C nine nine two, which is a five volt precision clock distributor clock generator. And and that's a product where we worked with Cypress to get the original uh, physical design archive and spice models, and and we're replicating that product. And there are several customers who are we're working with, uh, keeping them updated as we go along. We've got our first silicon lab right now, and we're taking a look at that. All right. Lastly, it, 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 we acknowledge it's a very difficult environment for the semiconductor industry. Uh, you know, they, there's the best thing that can happen in is communication in every case. Uh, there's a there's a sales guy at Rochester always says, "Let's have a conversation," and, and that's absolutely true. 
the more we know about what our customers need, the better we're going to be able to invest in the right places for you in the long run. Um, the the worst thing you can do uh, in 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 coming to anybody for a solution is is wait until the end and and wait until okay I I've got this I can't get the part anymore what can you do for me uh, we're certainly going to try to figure something out at that point but the more proactive we are at seeing a bill of materials on an older product line a bill of materials on something that you want to keep offering to the market the more we're going to be able to help you and I think that's that's the, the the ask from the audience for me is is give us some insight into what you have. I, under, I we understand the mill market doesn't have long term budget commits. That isn't that is the point. If we know what your system contains for products, we're more likely to see other people who might need the same type of solution and invest proactively. But unless we see that, we can't make that call. We can't do that. So if all you're coming to us with is here's a part number, there's a part number, and, and it's not as proactive as you could be. So one of the asks from me to the audience is to please come to us with a bigger picture, a broader picture of what, what problem you're trying to solve on your long-term system, and let us have some insight and let's, let, let us give you insight as to where we think uh, your biggest challenges are. So we've got supplier relationships, technical expertise, and experience to extend component livestock for critical applications, and we've been doing it for for 40 years. So I, I would just say, you know, trust us with uh, trying to come up with a solution for you. So with that, I've kind of uh, played out and done a whole bunch of talking, and I'm, I'm I think I'm ready to. Uh, uh, kind of go into some some questions here. So if uh, you want to go ahead, Jamie, fill Absolutely. me in. Absolutely. All right. Thank you so much, Dan. Um, now's the time to take questions and comments from our online audience. You can ask questions using the Q&A icon, the question and answer box on the toolbar. If you are or if we are unable to get to your questions during this webcast, we'll do our best to reach out to you after the event. And our first question, with regard to storage services, does Rochester perform quality checks on wafers that have been stored over a period of time? Um, the answer to that is, is, is absolutely. I, you know, the thing that, that um, I, I mentioned in the presentation is the, uh, uh, the white paper that we have and the material that you can download and look at. Uh, we we absolutely do quality checks on on the wafers we have in house, and we take it all the way through bonding to look for IMC uh, intermetallic uh, uh, connectivity in the bonding process, but also through to um, solderability and so forth. So I would say we we absolutely go through and, and check not just the waivers, but also that the uh, assembly process works all the way through. Okay. And I see Intel product replication. Do you handle Micron and... Um... Xilinx. I oh, think Xilinx, it. sorry. Yeah, yep, yeah, Xilinx. Yeah. yeah, so good question. Um, you know, it... it it absolutely um, the older Intel products. Just to be real clear, uh, you know, it, what we don't have is any of the more recent um, Intel products. Uh, that you know, first of all, I'm going to say that in general, uh, when you start talking about FinFET, FinFET semiconductor technologies, the products aren't portable, uh, or at least no one would want to pay you what it would take to port it. So. Uh, those aren't aren't really portable to that. But when it comes to Micron, and I, I'm going to be more general about SRAM and flash and uh, DRAM in general, mm. what we found over time is that uh, rarely does it ever make financial sense to try to port what is viewed as a commodity product. Um, it doesn't mean we wouldn't want to work more closely with with Micron and uh, AMD Xilinx than than what we are today, and I'll, I'll throw Xilinx out of that equation for just a second. But um, with Micron, Samsung, 
Hynix. If you take a look at any of those um, uh, higher volume SRAM, DRAM flash people, they're viewed as commodity products. And, and classically, commodity products are going to have pricing structures um, which are, from a U.S. perspective, $5 or less, typically $1, $2, those kind of things. And if you take a look at what it would take to create new silicon in advanced technology nodes, which these memory products typically are, and try to port those products to another semiconductor foundry, then go through memory qual and reliability and so forth, it's never made financial sense for somebody on the purchasing side who's, who, who wants an alternate product that could drop into my Micron slot, let's say, it's never made financial sense that they they would want to pay what it takes to actually do it. And and so this, sorry, I'm going to be a little long-winded on this question, but it, it kind of, it, it sets me down a, a path here where the products where it makes more sense to create new silicon and port the silicon are the products that are closest to impacting the system software. And, and, Really, when you when you think about the system software side of things, what products are 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 most important to a customer from that perspective? Processors, FPGAs, ASICs, uh, specialized analog components, and so forth. It's not most of the time. It's not the memory. The memories are important. Hey, you can't ship a system without them. I get that. However. They're not an impact to the software to a degree that you could justify new silicon. So uh, do we handle Micron and Xilinx, uh, uh, Micron specifically, Micron, Hynix, Samsung, so forth? Not generally. Um, we do have some product from them, but not. it's, it's not a focus like uh, some of the other products have been. With regards to Xilinx, I'll, I'll say that life is changing a little bit there with uh, AMD coming in. And traditionally, both Xilinx and Altera, I'll say it, their lives are both changing right now. Um, Intel acquisition of Altera and the AMD acquisition of Xilinx, they have both said that they're really trying to address the data center space with more programmable products for the data center traffic type. That's really the primary focus of those acquisitions was to create high-end processor architecture products that are more uh, configurable for the traffic they're going to see. And that it, there's other things they're doing with those the, those companies and those products for sure. But but. You can see that going forward, uh, there's going to be some challenges that, that both of them are going to have with regards to product availability and longevity and so forth that may force something different to happen. Um, right now, no. Um, in general, uh, companies that have gone down the uh, Xilinx and, and Altera path, their challenge is this. If they've designed in the latest Xilinx or Altera product, the latest Xilinx or, Al or Altera product are at the latest generations of technology. So if you take a look at a 28 nanometer FPGA before it goes FinFET or even FinFET, that's fine. We can talk about that too. If, if, you, if a customer has designed their design to leverage the technology that the FPGA has in it, to the maximum. They push performance inside that fabric. They've gone down that path. The only path for them, this isn't even getting into IP, but the only path for them, they can't jump out and go to ASIC because they're never going to be able to financially justify the cost of an ASIC asset to be able to get away from that FPGA if they've gone down that FPGA path. So in general, the market, especially the military market, is going to struggle mightily with trying to get away from FPGA, or are they just going to stay on it and keep going with that with that treadmill because that may be the only option that they have internally? So, we we offer alternatives for old, much older, uh, five volt and three point three volt 
FPGAs because those aren't on the market anymore as a rule. Uh, but when it comes to the latest FPGAs, I'm not sure there's a way to get out of them if, if that's what a customer wants because uh, they their design teams have typically designed them into it from a performance perspective and an IP content perspective. And if they can't continue to get that FPGA, I think one of the one of the only solutions for them is is redesign into the latest technology FPGA because of how they've designed and the IP they've used and so forth. So whew, sorry, Jamie, to get uh, really wound up on that one, but uh, it, there was a lot to that question. And I think uh, hopefully I gave some uh, more background to it. Absolutely. I actually have a follow up of sorts. Um, can military hardened products be replicated to identical test hardening as OEM? Sometimes yes and sometimes no is, is the answer. So it depends on the product. Uh, we've got a recent example where um, you know, we're, we're looking at a product where we don't see a way today with today's fab process availability that we could economically and um, in a timely manner recreate something that used to exist. Most of the time, however, that's not the case. Most of the time, yes, we can do exactly that. We can go through this path, except when it comes to, is the dye wafer going to be QML? Now, I'll debate all day with somebody who thinks that QML means great and everything else isn't. Uh, that's just not accurate. Uh, but what I can say is that we could recreate a product to be mill qual 883 so forth, but it but it new silicon won't be QML. There just aren't enough QML fabs out there to continue to extend the life of product in a timely and economic way. So the answer to that is yes, but you got to drop off the requirement that it be QML, because what is QML from a FAB perspective? It's really DLA's authorization of that FAB process and auditing by DLA. Uh, frankly, there's not enough business for most FABs to justify playing along being QML. It doesn't bring them more wafer business, so uh, there's really no financial incentive to go do that. So yes, we can recreate a military product but it's going to be tested to 883. It's not going to be QML silicon. So hopefully I answered that one thoroughly. Okay. What about recent parts gone obsolete? Are recent SDM components going to be supported? So I'm afraid I'm a, a bit of a loss for what SDM means to, to this person. So I'm going to, I'm going to take a guess and uh, um, recent, parts gone obsolete you know I can, I can give you an example where there there is no solution and and, and a recent example is uh, NXP got out of power PC processors that were fabricated on 40 nanometer SOI at uh, global foundries in fact and and there's no replacing that there's no that's it you better do the last time by because there's there's no there's no porting of that. There's no other equivalent fab process anywhere. Uh, heck, guys, that's the reason the product got discontinued is because that fab process was a special fab process. So when you talk about recent parts gone obsolete, sometimes yes, many times no uh, for whether or not uh, products are going to continue to be supported. So. I, I welcome the specific examples, um, and we can have a further conversation. Um, I, I, it's kind of hard to answer. Uh, can you handle everything that's ever gone obsolete? Um, the answer is going to be no. No, we can't. And uh, recent ones, sometimes yes, sometimes no. Depends on the product. Excellent. Factoring in the storage service you provide, how does it affect the economics of scale in regards to a custom ASIC, i.e., can we optimize order quantity versus order, or, yep, can we optimize order quantity versus order quantity plus storage? Okay. 
Well, let me let me uh, let me kind of broaden that out just a little bit. There's a lot to unpack there. Um, in general, when you talk about uh, ASIC for the military aerospace market, um, I've never seen a case where it's driving serious volume. Now, okay, surprise me. Maybe maybe there is something out there. So in reality, you think about the increment that you have to order a, a silicon. Increment is 25 wafers. It's a boat. Um, you have to order a boat at a time. There's no less than a boat uh, for production product. That doesn't doesn't exist. I have yet to see an ASIC from a military or aerospace account that really amounts to more than at the most four boats a wafer um, type of volume. Um, in, in silicon, now, it could be wrong. Maybe, maybe there's an example out there that's, that's a heck of a lot more. And no, no, you don't, you don't understand our market. I, I get that. But with regards to ASIC um, optimizing order quantity versus, yeah, there, there's minimum assembly requirements now uh, coming out of several of the uh, OSAT assembly houses, the larger OSAT assembly houses. And and you've got to do a minimum order quantity with them in order to not get hit with some kind of minimum lot charge on assembly. But, you know, give us the specifics on this because uh, my, my past experience, just to let you know, 14 years at Rochester was 20 years at LSI Logic. So, and a lot of my staff and a lot of a lot of my team is uh also asic background so we understand it just give us the specifics let us work through with you to uh uh kind of figure this out together okay and a question on how um how does rochester handle radiation testing yeah, it's a good question. Uh, there isn't a great answer, um, unfortunately. You know, radiation testing, because the market is so small, uh, there really isn't, um, it, it doesn't make financial sense for Rochester to invest in that. So uh, that's going to be sent out. It's going to be going somewhere else. Um, that's not a, uh, that's not something we're going to be doing in-house. So it, it, it is a send out thing. The volume just isn't there, and and frankly, uh, the amount of sources for different types of radiation are extremely limited uh, in the market. So you, you're you're likely to end up at White Sands if you're serious in this market. Um, we have for some products, and uh, uh, that's something we have to subcontract. We 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 do not have our own radiation source. Okay, Dan. Um, you've mentioned that Rochester has key uh, has relationships with key suppliers. Uh, can you elaborate on that a little bit? Yeah, let me talk about a couple couple more recent ones. Um, you know, ST uh, is a is a more recent um, uh, addition to what we have. Uh, you know, you can look at our line card. Uh, go to rockelect.com and you'll see our our line card. And and our line card has names long forgotten. Uh, I, I would say we're, we're always expanding um, as uh, our semiconductor partnerships, and um, uh, it, it, it is a constantly moving target with us as far as, uh, and we're always trying to it, it work more um, with more different uh, semiconductor companies out there. Uh, you know, we recently... Uh, uh, had an agreement with a with a smaller semiconductor company um, uh, called Mosis, where where they uh, uh, they were in need of a company that could assure uh, product assurance effectively that would be around for the long term. Uh, should they not be around for the long term to continue to supply the product, and and their customer was demanding that they work with somebody to ensure that and. Uh, it was a, a very, very good, and I'd say today a very, very good relationship with them as an example of, of somebody that we're continuing to work with, a small company even, that just need product assurance that they're going to continue to be able to supply the product, even if as a company they're not, their customer demanded it of them. Um, but we have very strong relationships with all the biggest uh, all the biggest companies, constant conversations with um, uh, TI, 
uh, it, it, analog devices, uh, ST, NXP, um, and, and many, many others. So um, I'd say we, we're, we're in pretty good shape there, but we're always looking to expand. Okay, Dan, and just a little bit of uh, clarification on a previous question you answered mm -hmm. about recent parts obsolescence. Yeah. Uh, SMD, in that case, they were they were referring to surface surface mount device. Oh yeah, okay, all right. So sorry, yes. Uh, surface mount devices in general and is a huge class of product. It's everywhere from lead frame devices to 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 um, uh, QFNs and BGAs and so forth. So. I would say SMD, where Rochester's headed, is we're 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 looking at uh, you know the the first investment was PLCC, like I said, where that's uh, the 44 and, and the 68 and the 84 pin uh, PLCCs that we've already um, we've we've got coming in and and on order um, to to get the mold tooling in house uh, is so. Surface mount device technology in general is extremely broad, but lead frames, lead frame technologies in S, in the SMD category are where Rochester's uh, primarily investing right now to overcome obsolescence and extend the life of products. Um, we are putting in a, a BGA line and and we've got the first of the bga equipment um on order and that's for a major product announcement that we're going to be coming out with here very shortly uh where we're extending the life of a um, uh, a processor from uh from a major semiconductor company and we're going to continue to offer it for the long term because uh, we know it's the right thing to do it's it's embedded in in long-term systems and uh that requires that we invest in in bga um and substrate and substrate design and and all that to continue to do that. So, I'd say yes, we're we're definitely all about SMD offerings, and uh, we're continuing to invest there. Okay, we are coming up against the top of the hour, so I think we'll do one last question here. Okay. Um, does Rochester provide testing service with the original test program? If not. Who would you recommend that would provide the most comprehensive testing to at least meet the data sheet specifications? Okay, so let me let me try to walk through that one just a little bit. So, yes, we provide testing service with the original test program if we're the people selling the silicon. What we don't want to get to and can't get into is taking the IP from the semiconductor company who has entrusted us with that IP to test broker product. That's not gonna happen. That isn't what we're going to do. We're not gonna validate broker product with the OCM test program. That, that violates tenants that, that, and agreements we have with the OCM and, and just doesn't, it, it isn't what we're gonna do. Um, as far as who would you recommend, um, I, I, I kind of don't want to go into that because that in some ways there's competition and, and other ways not. So I am afraid I'm going to dodge that, that part of the question here, but um, there are uh, very reputable test houses in, uh, in the U S um, that, that you can go to, to get product tested and, and, and some of the names bantering around um uh, your any company has uh, any of the big companies have always already used them. So um, I I know I know of one in particular um, that that I would go to. So you can talk we can talk offline and, and go figure that out. But um, yes, we do testing with the original test program, just only if we're offering the silicon uh, and and that. We don't we don't want silicon coming from elsewhere that uh, unless it was in the authorized channel and and if you can prove it's fully authorized not just traceability but actually bought from an authorized supplier and uh, then we might have a, a topic a conversation but if it it came from the broker market we're absolutely not going to be testing the product okay well thank you so much Mm -hmm. On behalf of Military and Aerospace Electronics and Endeavor Business Media, I would like to thank Dan Dice from Rochester Electronics for his insights and expertise. This webcast will be available on demand from the Military and Aerospace Electronics website at www.militaryaerospace.com. 
The link to the archived webcast will be sent to you via email within the next 24 hours. So thanks for coming. I'm Jamie Whitney, Associate Editor of Military and Aerospace Electronics.